Hi, welcome to the second lecture for class on Monday. Um, we're going to be talking about LGBTQIA activism and grief, um, uh, and disability grief, excuse me. Um, right now we're going to talk a little bit about Douglas Crimp's article, um, Mourning and Militancy, which came out in um, 1989 at the height of the AIDS crisis. Um, and I would say that was a seems like a distinctive um, turning point in the AIDS crisis in terms of uh, the the large amount of loss um, involved. I was uh, I started when I was in college uh, a ministry um, to an, a local AIDS HIV AIDS nursing center, um, but I I don't know if I understood. Um, and that ministry was a ministry of presence where. Um, we uh, brought along other college students and we just uh, reflected kind of active listening with patients and we, we journaled and reflected together a little bit. But I don't know if I had a, a big enough political context for that work. And uh, Crimp's article helps a lot with that. Um, and I think it's really helpful to talk about HIV AIDS crisis at its height, just as we're at the crisis of a, the height of another crisis. Um, coronavirus, and you could be thinking about um, similarities and differences uh, about around stigma, and whether you think um, uh, there were differences that have impacted um, communities back when it was an, uh, when HIV and AIDS um, impacted the gay community versus now as coronavirus impacts our society and um, who it impacts and how that impacts their social position. Um, so uh, the, the article talks about how grieving is complicated in the in, uh, grieving HIV AIDS loss is complicated. Um, if you'd like to hear uh, some some of the narratives from this time, one one good place to go is stories from the quilt, um, which is uh, you can Google that and get YouTube videos as well. Um, so. For Crimp, he says that mourning is complicated um, because, in part because of activism. And he says there's a move towards activism without uh, necessarily taking the step for mourning. Um, and it's complicated, this loss is complicated as well because met so many uh, gays and lesbians have complicated relationships with their families of origin, um, which can make grieving uh, more difficult. So, Crimp believes that AIDS is not just a matter of natural disease, but a, a failure of care that stems from political neglect. So you might be asking yourself, um, if you could think about other examples of loss that are like that, that combine um, medical concerns and symptoms with other kinds of loss that include, a include an element of political neglect. I think that might be true as well as we think about the rise of HIV and AIDS among uh, minoritized communities in the United States as well. Um, so Crimp talks about how gay folks are excluded from the life cycle at key junctures, actually um, meaning that their life cycle might be postponed just a little bit. Um, and he says that that means that they've struggled to get their grief needs recognized. He gives examples of a uh, Funerals where key grievers could not speak and acknowledge their loss because the funeral was in the closet. Um, caring for lovers with HIV and AIDS then um, includes survivor's guilt. And uh, one of the things I noted from this article was how young so many of the people grieving, um, how, many, how, how young many of the victims of the disease and many of their caregivers were. Uh, and there's the ambiguous loss of feeling relief when you're when the, when the caregiving is over. Um, so here's the paradox for Crimp. Uh, queer folks often live in a society where their sexuality is scrutinized in public, uh, while all the ways that society stigmatizes them makes it more difficult for them to uh, create bonds and develop them. He emphasizes that central role that hatred plays in homophobia and how it contributes to gay men being belittled even as they face fairly, very early losses. So this is uh, somewhat like the loss of the crucifixion when Jesus was taunted on the cross. Um, uh, gay men in the middle of the AIDS crisis had the double pain of being um, marginalized by, from their communities, but also being taunted um, as they were grieving, mocked for who they were. 
mocked for their loves. And so in light of all this, uh, Cramp wonders if militancy seems like the only option in the light of failures of care. Um, failures of care that underlie a, a kind of a loneliness caused by hom homophobia. And this loneliness um, impacts the, the grief patterns of gays um, in the 1980s, and it impacts the grief of all of us when we're not allowed uh, to share the losses that have impacted us. Um, so, um, so why does mourning trouble gay men? Where do you see the struggle of gay men to get their mourning needs recognized? Um, what are the psychic consequences and costs of following one's desires? And what are the psychic consequences and costs of not doing so? Um, and what, what grief and loss is involved in, the, in being queer, both in terms of uh, the societal pressures on you and then also the ways that your grief needs are not recognized. Um, so he talks about the silence equals death slogan, that graphic way of memorializing um, the appeals um, in, in the gay movement in the 1980s. And so there was a collective struggle around mourning because um, the needs for uh, care were not being met. Um, and so uh, people were taking up arms and demanding um, that their grief needs be acknowledged and that this disease be treated. Um, he talks about his own case of poison tears on page four, which was such a dramatic instance, I thought, of the delayed grief process. And I thought it was um, fascinating how that loss, the ability, lacking the ability to mourn for crimp led to an actual physical um, manifestation of loss in these poison tears. Um, he notes a fact that many AIDS activists in the 1980s um, took a militant stance in which mourning uh, wasn't allowed or wasn't respected um, because their loss had become politicized so quickly. You might think back on the example of abortion loss that we talked about last week. Um, so there's a message in this kind of ritual expression of grief versus activism. The, the activism says, don't mourn, organize, turn your grief into anger. Um, and thus there's a difference of opinion, um, in a sense, between activism and grief. They're not... Uh, we might look at this article now and say uh, that's a double tragedy because it alienates the griever from the grieving process even farther. And what we want um, is for people to feel like they can grieve. We want to challenge any disenfranchised grief and make um, include the, the grief of this particular loss so that people, who, people aren't excluded from the role of grievers at these key junctions in their lives. So I find talking about gay and lesbian identity in my classes in pastoral care often leads people to talk about their loved ones who've died, some from this disease and others, um, and also talk about uh, complications in the mourning process um, because of, uh, yeah, complications in the mourning process because uh, of the denial of this loss. So early on in the disease, some men uh, didn't get the disease named, and so they didn't get to mourn um, this uh, particular kind of grief. Um, and then he talks about how, almost paradoxically, we're forced to conceal our grief, he says. Um, and uh, the memory of lost friends becomes a part of daily assaults on the way we're forced to conceal our grief. Um, Ruth, there's a ruthless interference with, with mourning that desecrates the mourners and the memories of the dead because of how people in the public are talking about HIV and AIDS in the 1980s. So, um, so people who are gay in the 1980s are persuaded to relinquish their loves and their attachments. If you identify with those who have died, um, how can you escape guilt? So there's survivor's guilt. And then there's also guilt by association with really stigmatized disease is what I've noticed. So um, people who have HIV and AIDS often feel an extra pressure. It's different from cancer or diabetes. Uh, there's a different kind of stigma that's, that, uh, that attaches to it uh, that makes people sometimes uh, question their self-worth if they're not surrounded by a supportive environment. So Crimp says that the ways we're impatient with mourning is burdensome to the HIV um, activism movement. 
um, because it, it slows down uh, people's experience, uh, the rich texture of their experience, and it adds to their grief. The need to get over it and fight politically adds another layer of grief. Um, and he says that as a result, they've lost uh, the, the culture of possibility. Um, he also talks about learning to mourn pleasures that were not tolerated. Um, and that's one of the things that I really learned from working at the HIV AIDS uh, hospice as a college student was how important it was for these uh, particular patients to talk about the impact of HIV and AIDS on their sex life and, and their, their sense of self-worth as people. Um, so they wanted a chance to talk about the impact that HIV was having on them. And because of how deeply tied sexuality and spirituality are, those losses were intertwined. Um, and so he talks about, uh, with HIV and AIDS, cutting to the heart of your sexuality, now there's a sense of kind of moralizing self-abasement, where um, safe sex becomes a kind of a form of melancholia, of depression, um, that reinforces the ambivalence. Um, and he, he talks about um, the experience of feeling hated for who one is uh, and that how uh, really there's no sociological account um, that can take this seriously. Um, so I'm not sure about all this stuff about the death wish and the death drive, but... Um, Crimp draws our attention to how most people with AIDS died very young, and uh, people who cared for them also tended to die very young. And so um, there was a cycle of caregivers and loss, um, and people were entirely unprepared for it. Um, you might compare that to this time, but just add the, the sense of stigma. Um, so now uh, people in the gay community, Crimp says, we were, were forced to monitor their own illness and status, but with very little support. Uh, blamed, excluded, belittled, derided. So they, they faced uh, the, the suffering of HIV and AIDS, but they also faced being discrimin discriminated against, losing jobs, um, and dominant society uh, continuing to picture them as victims, wasting away in bed. Uh, so all of that means, uh, the, the way the media piles on these images means that there's a delay to the normal grief process. Um, and there's a push towards militancy. You have to protect yourself. You have to protect your identity. You have to respond to the oppression against you. And that response um, becomes a, a form of demanding an increase in care. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a, another form of denial, he says, but it's one that's still required. Um, there's still a need to fight uh, for human dignity, uh, for stories about um, sexuality and loves that stay close to the heart of people's true desires and their complexity as human beings. And uh, I would say part of the life that uh, the life under grace that is represented by gays and lesbians and transgender folk. Um, and so uh, mourning and grieving um, means mourning people whose society is rejected. So it's a kind of double loss. There's disenfranchised grief. There's uh, stigma. There's anticipatory grief because you're waiting for the next shoe to drop. There's chronic sorrow in conditions where the disease the, the disease lasts a long time. Um, and there's also uh, many people who are willing to uh, courageously remember, even when it's costly to them and it's costly to their loved ones, and they're fighting for memory of their loved ones in ways that um, do justice to the rich uh, texture of who that person was rather than just the stigma of an HIV or AIDS patient. Um, so uh, my one of my f favorite conversations uh, with an HIV AIDS patient when I was in college was a discussion of um, the, the book of song, uh, song of Songs and how beautiful that was to him. It was his favorite part of the scripture. And I remember uh, memorializing that with him and talking about um, the importance of his love um, and how he kept that alive through uh, the voice of scripture in the, uh, in, the, in the beautiful poetry of the Song of Songs, which for him wasn't so much an allegory for Christ as it was a testament to the healing and uh, profoundly humanizing power of love.